Thank you, Tiana. And she asked me for a very challenging task to talk about techniques to maintain adequate plant nutrition in 15 minutes. So what I wanted to do, and you've heard this concept a lot, is to think about the limiting factors. So I wanted to focus on the tree fruit industry in apples and cherry mostly, what they need, how the plants get these nutrients, and what factors can affect uh, the uptake of these nutrients, especially in our region, in Eastern Washington. So the most important, and I wanted to go through like a priority list. So the most important factor that the uh, trees need to uptake nutrients is actually light, because the most important nutrients are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And these nutrients account for 95% of the dry matter of the plant. So the most important um, condition factor for having a good nutrient uptake and nutrition in the plant is actually the sunlight. So we need good exposure and of course the water. With these two elements and the air, having the sunlight energy, we can create the uh, photosynthesis and have the main portion of our trees, uh, a good supply for that main portion of the tree. But of course, we want to focus in this talk on the, what we call the essential nutrients, the macro nutrients, the ones that are uh, demanded in higher quantities are nitrogen and potassium. And that's why I put them in, in bigger bubbles there. But we also need to think about other essential nutrients, macronutrients, we call it secondary calcium, sulfate, phosphorus, and magnesium. And there's a lot of others that I am not adding here, but some that are very important, especially for our region where we have alkaline soils are the micronutrients, boron, zinc, copper, manganese, and iron. Why I put this slide in the root is because these nutrients are mostly uptaken by the root, um, by the roots of the tree. So to understand better, to be able to manage better the nutrition, we need to then understand that because the pathway is through the roots and the roots here, roots are very important. You have heard a lot of uh, talks, uh, Andrew and David have, uh, and of course, uh, Tom, we all have talked about the importance of having in good, healthy root here, because that's the way, the pathway of nutrients. Now, there are differences between nutrients. Most of them, they go through mass flow. That means that they go with the flow with water. So nitrogen, calcium, magnesium, sulfate, copper, manganese, boron, and molybdenum, they all go with the, the water flow that gets into the plant. That means that we need to have uptake of water. So moisture and transpiration are also very important factors to be able to have these nutrients in the plant. Other nutrients that are macro and very in high demand uh, is potassium and also phosphorus. Those two are uh, moving into the root zone through diffusion. And this, I draw it as a, as a circle of from high concentration around the root um, to the root that is from high concentration to lower concentration. So the roots are always uptaking these nutrients and reducing that uh, um, concentration around the root zone. So there's a movement there. Again, the diffusion also needs moisture in the soil. And there are other elements like zinc and iron that they move in both ways, uh, mass flow and diffusion. This is a range of adequate levels. I'm not gonna stay in this table very long. I just want to show that we have this range of adequate level in our tree fruit webpage. And if you try to maintain the soil within this range, you are probably very good uh, in terms of the chemistry for nutrient uh, management. Now I'm going to start focusing on those uh, factors that are very important in our soil in eastern Washington. So one of them is the soil pH. And soil pH are, can affect the, so, the root uptake or the nutrient uptake in two ways. One is because the roots do like a pH, they are more comfortable within a pH of 5.5 to 6 or 7. 
um, but also because the nutrient availability changes in different type of pH. So you can see here that most of the nutrients are available within that range of six to about eight. Um, most of the nutrients are available. Now, in our soils in Eastern Washington, where we have our larger production area, our, a lot of our soils and within the range that I'm showing now, the 7.5 to 9. And you can see here, I'm going to show you here that especially phosphorus can be very deficient with high pH or in a bit not available. The same with these, all the metals, the metals like iron, manganese, boron, copper, and zinc, they reduce their availability. So under these conditions, the most important practice that you should be trying to do is to manage the pH. Sorry. Um, this is an example of the effect of um, high pH in soil. This is iron chlorosis in cherries, and it's this very characteristic yellowing uh, chlorosis in leaves and this is a similar symptomatology in in apples one thing that is very unique to iron chlorosis is probably the symptoms of the plant are the best indicators of that deficiency and because iron is affected most dramatically with the change of pH sometimes it, it covers the deficiency of other metals like manganese, copper, and zinc. So if you have iron chlorosis in your, in your uh, orchard, in your plant, you most likely have high pH and you have to manage the pH uh, before you want to manage the nutrition of those elements. These are other examples of consequences of uh, high pH in soils. I'm gonna show here one that is important, especially when we don't put uh, phosphorus in our soils at planting, you have this uh, brownish uh, border in the leaf that is related to phosphorus. And I'm gonna give the, the other two maybe for questions because that's a whole new story. <clears throat> in, in Washington, what have um, a lead to high pH? In most cases is because we have a layer uh, that we call the caliche, it's a layer of calcium carbonate that when it's in contact with water, you can see here the chemical reaction, it releases OH. And so that increases the pH of the environment. And that increase of pH uh, due to the parental material, which is the, the, the mineral of the soil, the problem is that it's hard to manage uh, one, so you have to live with it. Uh, the buffer capacity means that you can reduce the pH by different management practices, but it will always increase, go back to the normal uh, high levels of pH. So it's a lifetime effort. Now, besides reducing the nutrient availability, the calcium carbonate in some areas can also be a physical impediment because it creates a layer that reduces uh, the possibility for roots to go and penetrate. So they normally stay in the upper layer of the soil, but also it reduces the water movement through the soil. So it's a layer, an imped a physical impediment of movement of water. And because this layer is very variable, uh, in the orchard, uh, in depth, the variability of this layer um, can create a high variability of um, growth and impediment throughout the orchard. So with that, I want to go back to the idea that we need to maintain healthy roots because that's, those are the first uh, and most important ways that the nutrients will be taken up. So if we think about limiting the impact, we we mentioned before, you know, light exposure, we need water, and of course we have a healthy root. Now, because uh, healthy roots can be affected by many um, factors, and I'm gonna go back to this physical barrier, and just, I want to show this one because it's, it's been very common, at least in the Yakima Valley, that sometimes we don't have the calcium carbonate layer, but we do have a layer of compacted clay. And this is very common in the soils in Washington with different formation. 
um, where we have different layers of textured soil. So in this case, we have a layer of uh, more clay type of soil that is more compacted. So the roots grow only in the surface of uh, that soil and you have less area for growth. But there are other limiting factors. And so just to think about in your soil, again, like I mentioned before in the video, doing a profile, a peep in your ground will sometimes help you to identify right away what could be the limiting factor before you have to do any other type of analysis. Because these are, are one big priority. If you don't have roots, you won't have uptake. Now I'm going to go to the topic of nutrition in the soil. Um, and I'm going to only focus, because the short time, I'm only going to focus on those that I think are very important for Washington growing, uh, tree fruit growing region. This is a prospection that I did with a project with the USDA, and we evaluated all the nutrient analysis and physical properties of soils. And here I want to show that, for example, for calcium, that is one element that growers put a lot in a, in a weekly basis throughout the season because of the bitter peat problem and calcium related disorders. Only three soils were low in calcium availability. This is the line that we consider an adequate range. The rest of the soils were within the adequate range and even in the very high range of calcium availability. Now, when we plot the calcium levels in the soil with the potassium levels in the soil, another cation, that's where we see most of the problems. Because I have never seen values this high in my life, and I have done a lot of soil samples, especially back in Chile, where I come from. Anyway, so here is the 200 parts per million, which is recommended for tree fruit growing. You can see that when we have low values of calcium available, we also have low values of potassium available. And these soils are sandy soils in Marua. So it really uh, is it, very common in a sandy soil where you have both in limiting um, quantities. But that's very easy to manage, I think. So, but the rest, where it's more challenging, is when you have adequate levels of calcium in the soil, especially in the uh, mid range, but you have these levels of 700 parts per million, 800 parts per million, because then you have a big imbalance of cations in your soil. And we know that. When we have a, a cation imbalance, we might have uh, difficulties for uptake. Here is a chart that shows with nitrate, uh, sorry, with ammonium, ammonium also has a chart. And when we have too much ammonium in, the, in our soil, we have a, a very big decline of uh, potassium when that uh, ammonium increases. So reduces the availability of potassium. This is also one very well known in this region. When we have high levels of potassium, we can affect the uptake of calcium and magnesium. The upper line is magnesium decline when we increase potassium, and the lower line is the decline of calcium availability. So within these nutrients, there's also differences in the impact of availability for these different nutrients. So calcium is really impacted by high levels of potassium, and you can see it here the range of 200, it really reduces calcium availability. Okay, so not sure how I'm doing with time, but I want to talk about something a little bit more practical about the when. When uh, we need to then start thinking about these nutrients, and I'm going to focus on the, the most complex one. And this is uh, a well, before that, I'm going to talk about the conditions in the spring. Why the spring is so important? Because we've been measuring, and this has been also confirmed with the work by Denise Nielsen and others, that root growth start require moisture at developmental stage, but also requires temperature in the soil. And what we have seen is that in apples and in cherries, the temperature required for root growth is about 59 Fahrenheit, which is around 15 degrees Celsius to start growing. 
And in some cases, we might have two peaks of growth. And those timings are when the roots are uh, uptaking most of uh, the nutrients. This is a work done by Denise Nielsen, and it also um, shows not only when the roots are growing, but also shows the use of nitrogen by the plants in different states. And what the most important part here that I want to highlight is that the first stage of growth, and this is also for cherries in other work, everything relies on the reserves that are in the roots, the healthy roots from the previous year. And around 40 days, 40 to 60 days after full bloom is when you actually start using the nitrogen that is in, in the same season, the uptake of nitrogen from the same season. Keep this in mind for what I'm gonna be speaking later, but everything needs to be uh, analyzed in combination to be able to make a good uh, management decision. Okay, so this is a very busy slide. I, I don't like very busy slides, but it's important just to show the complexity of nitrogen. And this is the cycle of nitrogen. What I want to show here uh, is that whatever we put in the soil, either manure, compost, or fertilizer, will uh, mineralize. Uh, it will take some time depending on the source and the condition of the soil, but it will end up in the form of ammonium and nitrogen. Both forms are the forms that the plant can uptake, are the uh, av available forms of nitrogen for the plant to uptake. Now, ammonium, because it has a charge, can be adsorbed to the clay particles of the soil. So that's a good thing for ammonium in terms that we don't lose it right away because it can be adsorbed into the clay particles. But if we put ammonium under very hot condition and dry condition, we can lose that ammonium in the form of a in the volatilization process here. So that's the good part, the absorption that stay longer in the soil, but also it can volatilize. In very high pH, in pH above the 8.5, it can also be lost by volatilization. Now ammonium eventually will become nitrate in the soil. And nitrate, the problem that we have is that it doesn't have a positive charge, so it doesn't stay in the clay particles and it can be leached. If we don't have also oxygen in our soil, if we irrigate too much and we have lack of oxygen, uh, the uh, microorganisms can denitrify the nitrogen, and so we can also lose it by denitrification. What is the main point here is that there's many losses uh, in the nitrogen application. So let's think about the stage of root growth in the spring, the requirement of the plant to uptake uh, nitrogen, especially in the spring, 40 to 60 days after full bloom. So then when do we need to apply nitrogen? Uh, is during that period of root growth. If you apply nitrogen before uh, in, in, in the cold soils or during the winter or even in the fall, uh, you most likely gonna lose that nitrogen. So it's not a very uh, efficient way to manage nitrogen in the soil. And to finish up with this, I'm not so sure, I think I don't have any more time, but just to finish, this is a contrast. Phosphorus is completely the opposite. It doesn't, we don't lose uh, phosphorus in the soil um, by these other ways that we lose nitrogen. So it stays in the soil. So the timing for phosphorus could be any time of the year whenever you feel that it's more practical for your orchard to apply the phosphorus. The downside of that is that it doesn't move very much, so it's hard to reach to deeper zones if our roots are growing deeper in the soil. It's a, a little bit more of a challenge. So with that, I'm going to leave you with this phrase from my colleague, uh, Andrew McGuire, here in the meeting that I think is fundamental. For me, it's very hard to give one recommendation for everybody uh, because I think it has to be done block by block. 
And so the biggest question is go and try to identify what is that problem in your soil to be able to manage that nutrition. With that, I'm, I'm finished and open for questions.